Welcome, lovelies. Welcome to Cider 101 this afternoon. Uh, my name is Jamie Doran. I'm the background moderator. I'm just going to go over a couple of things real quick. I'm part of the Woods team, and here in Sacramento, I'm vice president of that damn brew club. Uh, we're kind of think Folsom Dam, Folsom from the Country Song Blue Cup. And a little Crowdcast 101 as we get started. Um, use the text thread to chat and make comments. If you have a question, please use the ask a question function. It'll make it easier for us to track them. You can also up and down vote questions that you especially want answered. And if you have connectivity issues, head over to the exhibit hall or use the tech help button, which is green below the screen. And Michelle, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Jamie, appreciate it. Hey everyone, how are we doing today? Thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited to talk a little bit about cider. Cider was not my first love, it was beer. Beer still is my first love. Uh, but I have celiac disease and uh, it brought me to a journey of the wonderful world of cider. Um, I currently am in Oklahoma City. I'm the assistant general manager at Skydance Brewery. Uh, I moved here about a couple of months ago from New York City. Uh, from cider maker to now in production and beer. Uh, and we're actually looking into uh, possibly doing some experimental ciders and beers and uh, you know, other fun fermentation projects uh, when we open up our tap room this summer. So, so excuse me, so I'm pretty excited. I hope that you folks have some uh, cider ready and we're gonna get started. So let me share my screen. If you have a question, be sure to uh, use the box below as Jamie said. Let's get started. Let's see, application, here we go. All right, hopefully everyone can see that. Awesome, awesome. So first things first, uh, I want to define cider. What is cider? Uh, cider is an alcoholic beverage. It's made from fermenting apples. So I know there's a lot of misconceptions of what cider is right so you go to a farm stand and they have cider uh you know some people you know in the fall they'll say oh yeah we're you know we're having spice cider uh and we're at a point now where we want to define cider as just alcoholic beverage you know made from apples that's cider anything else is juice so moving on these slides today when I say juice, that's what I mean. Cider is absolutely alcoholic cider. I know some folks still refer to it as hard cider. We're gonna just call it cider. Uh, with cider, I mean, you could have different uh, fruits added to it. Hops, obviously you have a background in beer. I love to add hops, uh, but essentially it's just fermented apples. Um, also, there's another confusion with cider uh, with grafts. So grafts are you know partial grains and partial uh, juice and you know that's considered a beer uh, so anything that's like an apple beer is definitely a beer it's definitely not cider uh, you know and then we have apple wine so I know it's a kind of a gray area uh, but that's where we stand with cider right so let's get into some fun facts about cider so there are over 7,500 apple varieties in the world and 2,500 are actually grown here in the US uh, some of the bigger states include New York, uh, Washington State. Uh, we also have them in Virginia. Uh, so we've got some pockets across the U.S. Uh, that actually grow these apples. And obviously it depends on like what territory and how the weather is and, you know, the soil. You know, that really determines, uh, it really goes into what apples are grown. First apple tree here in the U.S. was uh, in the 1600s. Uh, it's pretty huge. I mean, quite popular. People made their pies. Uh, they actually started uh, using apples to you know, ferment and make these delicious beverages that we know today. Uh, but sometime in the 1900s, during the temperance movement and prohibition, unfortunately, orchards were burned down and uh, they did not recover until now. Uh, they burned down and we had a lot of settlers from Europe that came in, they moved into the cities and they started making beer, brewing beer. Uh, industrial parts, uh, specifically lagers, very closely to the ciders, you know, low ABV, easy to make, um, sessionable, and uh, that kind of replaced the apples. And uh, it took a while, but we're back in town. <laughs> there are about uh, over a thousand cideries in the US, and the cider industry is just booming. I mean, it's booming every year. Uh, and so we're going to go into some classifications 
of these cider apples. Uh, so we have acid, malic acid, and tannins. Uh, so the acid, when I speak about that, that's you want to think of the freshness and tartness and sourness of the uh, of the actual cider or you know apple itself. Same thing with phenolics. Uh, that gives it the characteristic of the flavor, uh, characteristic to the flavor of the cider. So those kind of go hand in hand when you're thinking about what apples to use, what juice to use to make your cider. Uh, and then we have a range, it's a scale. The American Cider Association is, uh, uh, they put out this scale. It's pretty much like, I don't know, it's industry wide that we use. Uh, we have dry, semi-dry, semi-sweet, and sweet. Uh, so they typically use the scale for like BJCP judging as well and other competitions. Uh, you know, if you're going to make your own cider, uh, it's definitely useful to uh, use these words and these categories uh, to understand like what ciders you want to make. Uh, I tend to go for dry ciders. I love them. Uh, but sweet ciders are just as great. I know um, a lot of folks will tend to try ciders and say, oh, well, this cider is terrible because it was sweet. Well, it may not be terrible. It may just be a sweet cider, and that's okay. Um, and so, you know, there's different categories for them. None are better than the other, and vice versa. None are worse. But um, it's a scale that I like to use. We use in our industry, right? Go. So moving on, when you know, obviously talking about the acid and the tannins, the different categories we use is uh, sharp, sweet bitter sharp and bitter sweet. And so they each have their own little box that they go into, right? So the sharp apples, uh, like Arkansas black, they're high acid and like high tannin. Uh, and then you have obviously the, the sweet apples, Macintosh Pink Lady, it's low acid, and low tannin. Uh, so a lot of these apples that you may see, uh, see may be familiar to you. Some of them may not. Uh, I'll go into, you know, which are heirloom apples and which are modern or culinary ones. Uh, also categories that we uh, classify these apples in. Um, so let's go into that a bit. Whoopsies. There we go. Got it. All right. So we've got heirloom and we've got modern. Those are the standard styles. This is according to the ACA. Then we have specialty styles. We have fruit, botanical, wood age, rosé, sour, goes on. You know, we have ice ciders also in that category. I'm just gonna cover a couple today uh, just to kind of keep everything on track. Um, so when people see, obviously there's uh, the heirloom apples, right? And then we've got the modern apples. A lot of folks ask, well, which is the best to use, right? Uh, which one makes a better cider? And I had um, my professor, Chris Gerling at the uh, Cider Institute in North America, it was Cornell Agritech that I went to school for. Uh, this was a training, it was a certification program. He asked this question to us, and this question I ask everyone, well, what makes the best cider, right? Um, and the answer is whatever you have available to you. And I was just having a conversation with Jamie about this. You know, I just moved to Oklahoma City, and I'm not in New York. I can't just go to the orchard and get fresh juice, and I can't just go pick my apples, you know, when it comes time, for, you know, in the fall. Uh, so right now, like, what I'm drinking uh, is store-bought juice. And again, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but you want to use the juice that you have available to you. Um, because, you know, how else are you going to make cider, right? All right. So heirloom apples, I mentioned them a couple slides ago. Those, uh, this, these over here that I'm giving examples for, bittersweet, bitter sharp. We got Kingston Black. We have Dabinet. And these are apples that are 100 plus years old. Um, and some of the cideries that use them today, I mean, you may not even know unless you actually take a look at the labels or uh, unless you actually understand uh, the complexity of the apples, which ciders are actually, they're actually using heirloom apples. Uh, so stop and pick up the, you know, the can or bottle or check out their websites. Uh, and that's how you can familiarize yourself with the types of heirloom apples, especially the single varietals. So we got Spy Games here, Cider Creek makes a uh, single one from uh, upstate New York. Then we got Texas Keeper, they actually use a blend. And what's interesting about them is they have a breakdown behind every uh, cider that they make of all the heirloom apples that they use. And I believe they get them shipped in. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, stopping there a couple of years ago. And now that I'm in Oklahoma, I'm going to take a drive there a couple of weeks, check them out again. 
Um, but that's one way you can familiarize yourself with the heirloom apples, which possibly, most likely, may not be available to you for you to, to sample and try and experiment with. Uh, that's one way of understanding what those apples are. Uh, the next one, oh, geez, I gotta not use my mouse. Uh, next one, culinary, modern apples, low tannins, high acid. Bet you recognize these names, right? We got Gala, Fuji, Granny Smith. We all know them. We all love them. These are the ones that you typically see, you know, when you go to the food store. Uh, and then in the fall, if you go apple picking at the markets, they're juicy and fun and sweet. And, well, Granny Smith, not so much. But uh, these are the ones that we eat. Sometimes we bake with them. So those are, you know, just to give you an idea, these might be easier to spot and understand just because we have them available. Uh, but here we go. And some examples, we have fruit ciders. So fruit ciders, uh, blackberry, pomegranate, mango, peach, whatever you want to use, pineapple. Uh, Riverhead Cider House, they make uh, a wonderful line of fruit ciders. Uh, so to the left, that one I believe was a blackberry cider. And to the right, that one's raspberry. Um, that one is out of Portland, Portland Cider. Uh, great examples of fruit ciders that you may see in the store. Another example of specialty styles is botanical ciders. So we've got botanical ciders typically are vegetables, spices, herbs. Um, I actually saw a quite unique one um, while I was judging that somebody made a cider with purple carrot. Like purple carrot. How amazing is that? Uh, the sky's the limit when it comes to making these, you know, specialty ciders, and I believe so with botanical ciders. I know a place upstate, uh, they make seed and stone, they make uh, spruce tips, which I've used before to put in my cider. And so it's just exciting to see that this category uh, has blossomed, unintended, over <laughs> the last few years. Uh, you know, so the left we have Seattle cider, basil mint, and to the right, it's nice and naughty. I believe that one might be an imperial pumpkin, I think. Um, but yeah, that's the category that you would be in uh, if you decided to make a cider for that. Uh, and the subcategory, I had to throw it on because, hey, it's the international, the Women's International Beer Summit. How could I not add this to the category of uh, botanical ciders, hop ciders, citra, cascade, crystal mosaic, et cetera, galaxy, whatever you may you know, whatever you may want to use. Um, I'm actually drinking uh, Mandarina Bavaria. Got a little lazy, didn't carbonate them, but hey, I like still ciders, right? Uh, so it's okay. Uh, cider Geist, uh, Cider Geist and uh, Citizen Cider, they both use uh, different hops. I believe Lake Hopper uses a blend. Um, I'm not trying, I don't remember which blend they use. Uh, but the other one on the left, uh, I think it's just a single one. So it's really up to you how many you want to use. I recommend not to go too crazy. I've seen uh, ciders with like five different hops. Uh, you got to be really careful for two reasons. Uh, one being uh, you don't want to lose the actual, you don't want to lose the idea of the cider. You don't want to lose the cider in the hops, right? We're not just drinking hop juice. Uh, you know, you want to make sure that the apple is very, uh, comes through still. Um, and another thing to notice, not that you may care or not, but um, a lot of cider drinkers don't typically drink beer. And so, you know, if they are gonna try a hop cider, they may try one that has maybe one hop, one, you know, uh, varietal, maybe not two. Uh, I don't mind having three, but you know, that's just me again, beer background. You know, and lastly, you know, if you're making it for yourself, then definitely experiment, see what you like best. Um, and that's, really, uh, you know, you could, how you can gauge what you want to use and how much you want to use and that sort of thing. Next specialty category, wood age ciders. So these ciders are barrel age. They have bold wood characters, smoky. Sometimes people do like a smoked chips. Uh, sometimes they do French oak. Uh, as a uh, amateur cider maker, uh, which we are all here to learn, uh, you may want to use wood chips or spirals. So one thing I like to do when I make my cider is, uh, and we'll get through obviously the whole process of doing it at home, um, is when I'm done making my cider, I usually take a mason jar with a little bit of vodka, probably like six ounces of vodka, and um, I'll throw in, or, or, or whiskey, I'll throw in these wood chips or these spirals, um, 
and add some spices to it, some cinnamon to it, some brown sugar, uh, and shake it up and leave it for a couple of days. And then I'll filter it through and throw that in my batch, uh, typically a five gallon batch if I'm doing those many ounces. And that usually provides the barrel aged like flavor profile that I wanna get uh, without actually like having a big you know, cask at my house. Um, and so that's been pretty useful for me. I know a lot of folks will then, you know, try to smoke them up a bit and throw them in there in secondary. That's also an option. Um, but that's typically what you would use as a home brewer. And one of my examples that I want to use today was Angry Orchard. They make, uh, I think it's called Wooden Sleeper. I believe it has some maple syrup in there. Uh, I had them when they first came out like years ago and I kept it for like five years and I finally popped it open before I moved here as like my little hurrah, like going away celebration. And then they came out with these like teeny little cans. It was like 10 and a half uh, uh, ABV, like super small. And I was going to share them with people, I didn't. And then they came here with now bigger bottle, they reinvented it, it's fantastic. Uh, this one I'm waiting to share with friends. I gotta be nice once in a while. And uh, so that was an example that I've seen out there. For me, uh, where I'm at, where I was back in New York, tough to come by commercial uh, barrel-aged ciders. Uh, if you can make one at home, I recommend it. If you enjoy that kind of thing, uh, wood chips and spirals, definitely the way to go. All right, so enough about, oh, no, we got one more slide. I lied, two more for specialty. <laughs> so we got rosé ciders. Rosé ciders have been like, like the hot thing for the last two summers, not so much last summer, because of our pandemic, but um, they're beautiful in color. Um, some cideries, and I gotta be honest with you, I've only come across this, I am sure there are more out there, but I've only come across a small percentage that actually use the Geneva crab. Um, most of the cideries that I've come across have used raspberry pomegranate to get that color, just a little bit of it to get that, that oomph, that boost in color, um, and there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, but uh, folks have used just a little bit of it just to, to get that beautiful pink color, that blush, or their version of a rosé, they'll say. And uh, two examples that I came across that I enjoyed, um, uh, Kings Highway, upstate New York, obviously from New York, I use a lot of New York here today, I realize. Uh, Beach Party Rosé, and then Sea Cider, um, Ruby Rosé, I believe that's uh, somewhere I think it's in the Northwest, Pacific Northwest, I believe. Um, both fantastic examples, both very different, not just in packaging, but um, just the flavor profile. Um, but it's an exciting color and it's new and it's fun and everyone's drinking rosé, great for summers. Um, and that seems to be pretty much a seasonal thing. Uh, so that's one example that you guys can use if you wanna try to make a rosé cider. We have sour ciders, this is the last specialty cider that I'm gonna talk about today before we hop in and see uh, how we make this beautiful cider. Uh, sour ciders, they're high acid, uh, typically lactic acid, hazy, sour, unfiltered. Um, two examples I have here, Graft, they make a Goza cider, and I can't read the other one, but the other one is actually a uh, hopped peach Goza as well. Um, which is interesting, it's a crossbreed of like three different categories, but because it's a sour cider, typically like the, the base of it all, I threw it into the sour cider. Another exciting thing that you could do for sour ciders or um, just like wild ciders, I guess you would say, uh, is, and I've experimented with this before, um, just taking the skin of the apples and actually throwing them in there uh, while your cider is fermenting. I mean, I gotta be honest with you, you're gonna get some funky stuff, but uh, it's worth a try. Um, I've also tried doing a little cool ship with my cider and it's just, it's weird. It's just exciting and wild and crazy. And you know, that's the beauty of home brewing and cider making, right, at home, uh, just seeing what you could come up with. All right, so let's get into the cider making process. And so I borrowed this, um, this chart from the Cider and Perry Production uh, Foundation by Peter Mitchell, and that's the class I was talking about earlier. Cornell Agritech um, offers it. Uh, I believe other parts of the country offer it as well. But it's the Cider Institute of North America, and they have a great, like, extensive certifications from you know the beginning to intermediate to yeast analysis to sanitation, so on and so forth. Not just with cider, but like beer. 
and distilling. And I'm pretty sure they have wine as well. Um, but I had, uh, you know, I was excited to go there. I went there a couple of years ago. And um, I love this chart. I pulled it off the book and shared it with all of you because um, it was to the point, pretty simple to read uh, and understand uh, if you're explaining the cider making process. Uh, so most of the folks would hop down to receiving the juice, but uh, if you're fortunate to have an orchard or work with an orchard, the first step is obviously uh, harvesting the apples. So harvesting the apples, uh, you know, using a farm, working with an orchard if, uh, if you're fortunate enough to. And then you would mill and press them. So you're grinding down the apples and pressing it for juice. Um, you know, like I said, most cideries at this point would have like the juice sent to them. But uh, the first two steps, uh, you know, most people, if you could like expand eventually, get it on a farm, you know, that's where they would start. And the same thing with home cider making. So you would pick up the apples and you would use a grinder and, you know, with the hopper and throw the apples in. Photos in the next couple of slides, you could take a look at that and just kind of crush them down and grind them down. Um, and then you'd go ahead and juice them. Um, it's quite exhausting if you're doing it by yourself. I recommend getting family and friends involved. Um, so yeah, so those are the first two steps. The next one, someone says make a slide a little bigger. How's this look? Hold on, just trying to see you folks. Ah, can I make the slide bigger, let's see. No, no, how to make it bigger. Hmm. I have focused the presentation to make it as large as I can get it. Oh, okay, I'm trying, let's see. They won't let me. Okay. No, Michelle, you can't, but I did it for you. Oh, you did? Okay, great. Awesome. Sorry, folks. All right. Back here. <laughs> My bad. All right. So, yes, the first two steps. Next step, fermenting. Selecting the yeast that you want to use. And we'll get into what yeast to use. Uh, again, it's always based on preference when you're doing it from home. Uh, but there's some suggested ones. Uh, um, you know, you have cideries that use the white wine yeast. You have cideries that use champagne yeast. You have cideries that use brewer's yeast. Uh, so you pick this yeast that you want. Uh, and then you just start fermenting. Uh, once it's fermented, you rack. So you basically transfer your juice. Uh, you may filter it at this point if you choose. Um, some cideries, uh, they don't filter, or they say unfiltered, or they'll filter it once and still call it unfiltered. Uh, there's a little bit of description to you when it comes to that. Uh, and then you would blend it. So uh, you could blend with other juices, uh, other fruits. Um, you could bring it to secondary. And at this point, um, add a, a, your tincture in that I was talking about a couple slides ago with my, my spirals and whatnot. Um, and the last one is packaging. So bright tank, canning, bottling, kegging, um, you know, home brewers, we're going to talk about bottling and kegging. Today, we're just going to get into bottling. Um, just simply way to just get started. Uh, and I believe cost effective compared to the kegging. Right. All right. So how do we do this at home, right? This actually is that recipe here, so. And as you could see, uh, the top left photo, those are my apples. I chop them up, I peel them, it's just something I like to do. And then I grind them, and it's this beautiful mush. And then um, I place them into my juicer. Well, I juice it, and it comes out, put it in a pot. Um, and so that's, that's how I do this when it comes to the full time. Not sure how I'm gonna do this here in Oklahoma, but. Let's say we start with juice, right? Store, bought juice, farm, pressed juice. Um, this one, you're gonna need one gallon of apple juice without preservatives, two one gallon jugs. One you're gonna obviously use for fermenting, the other one I used to like transfer in. Uh, airlock, uh, a lot of homebrew shops will sell the, you know, the airlock uh, set that you can get with it, with the stopper. Uh, Star sand sanitizer, uh, yeast packet, I'm recommending for this actual homebrew, uh, this actual uh, cider making, WLP 775 English uh, Cider Yeast. Uh, this one is actually from White Labs. Um, and then yeast nutrient, a cup of sugar, white or brown, whatever you decide to use, and a, a hydrometer kit, that's optional. And I'm gonna touch a little bit about it in case uh, you're unfamiliar with uh, using a hydrometer. Um, but you know, it's optional. If you don't really care about the ABV, uh, that's fine. Uh, or you just want to experiment, see where it goes as your first batch is fine. Try to keep the costs down when it comes to making cider for the first, uh, for the first time. 
Uh, I can see the chat. Let's see, what apple juice do you get? Um, the apple juice that you can use, anything store-bought uh, without preservatives, uh, farm, uh, fresh pressed juice as well. I, you know, you can use like Apple and Eve or Mott's. I, you know, some people actually will like frown upon suggesting that, but if we're making this at home for us to make our cider, why not? I've seen like a ton of home brewers win like gold medals using like Mott's apple juice. And it really comes down to your recipe and how much you care about your cider and, um, you know, sanitation, you know, at the end of the day. But if you're going to start, let's say for this particular recipe, we're going to start with just like store-bought juice, no preservatives. All right. So what do we do? So here's what we do. Uh, so we're going to sanitize everything. We're going to wash everything, sanitize everything, measuring cup, utensils, everything you may use, anything you think you may use. I like to like put everything out, mental checklist of what I need, and clean everything. And, uh, you know, same thing with sanitizer. Follow the bottle. Make sure you make a proper amount. I like to use just a general practice for like whether I'm, you know, brewing, assisting brewing in the production at Skydance or at home. I get a big bucket of Sani and I just leave it there in case I like need anything, like just in case. I do that and I actually get another bucket of just like emptiness just to like throw in everything dirty that needs to be washed later. So it's just nice to be like prepared instead of like scrambling, right? Um, so that's what you're gonna wanna do. Uh, and so you're gonna pour the juice, right? Not cider yet, the juice into the jug. I like to make my cider obviously with fresh pressed apples if I get it in the fall uh, using local juice that I just answered or a local orchard, you know, store boat juice, totally okay. Then we're going to add the sugar. So some folks like to boil it down with a little bit of water. Um, with this one, you could just literally just dump it in against okay, your first batch, mix it up real well. Uh, and then we're going to put the yeast. Uh, what I recommend was English cider yeast in the juice. Now, can you use brewer's yeast? Absolutely. I love using brewer's yeast. I use SO4, SO5, Nottingham, English style yeast. Um, you know, people can use Cezanne yeasts. Um, whatever yeast you use, though, please be careful and just make sure you understand uh, the temperature for it. And take that in consideration as well. Um, then you're going to add the yeast nutrient. Again, it, it varies per like bottle. The one I get in my homebrew shop is one teaspoon per gallon. And I just dump that in there. And then you cap it with an airlock and you fill it uh, with some sanitizer. Uh, some folks use vodka. <laughs> Why waste vodka, right? So I use the sanitizer that I have in that little that bucket over there. And you put your jug, your one gallon jug, uh, in a temperature control environment. Again, following the instructions of the yeast packet uh, to ensure healthy fermentation. Um, most of us are not fortunate to have a controlled environment, but just keep that in mind. It is going to affect uh, how your cider is going to come out. Uh, and then I let that sit for two to three weeks. I store it here in Oklahoma in my little laundry room on the on the floor, covered up and everything uh, for a couple of weeks. Uh, and then when you're done, you siphon it, you rack or transfer it to a second sanitized jug. And you just don't want to siphon the yeast. So what you're going to want to do is have the, the one with the juice at this point in cider. You're going to have your cider usually on your countertop if you want or on a chair. And then you'll have your second jug on the floor or on the chair. It depends, you know, make sure you have a long enough siphon, auto siphon with tube. Uh, and you're going to transfer it without uh, picking up the yeast. Um, and then once you're done with that, you know, let it sit for another couple of weeks. All right. Gravity reading. Now, at this point, um, you, oh, geez, that was supposed to be the first one. I lied. All right. So <laughs> I missed my slides up. So for this, uh, for gravity reading, if you want to take a gravity reading, um, you can take a gravity reading before you ferment or uh, and also after it's done fermenting. And so what you want to do is get a hydrometer, you get a cylinder, um, and you're going to want to put a sample of your juice. Okay, let's just backtrack a bit. The juice wants the sugars in there. You can take your reading at that point and write it down. And then you take another reading when it's completed, when it's fermented. And that is the calculation that you can use to calculate ABV, or you can use an online calculator, which I tend to use. Again, temperature tends to affect this as well. Um, but that's if you want to, when I said back here, the hydrometer kit, if you want to pick that up, that's uh, helpful to you. You can definitely take readings for that and uh, you know, jot everything down, take notes, take a ton of notes. 
sometimes you make a recipe and you really, really like it and you just forget like, oh, when did I transfer it? What was the reading, you know, during the fermentation if you want to take, you know, I don't recommend you keep opening up your site or take a reading throughout the fermentation process, but you know, what was your, you know, OG and final gravity? Like, what was it? You know, uh, it's helpful to, to write that down. I, that was a mistake actually I made as a home brewer, like years and years ago that I never wrote anything down. And like, it was so simple to just write it down in a notebook and I don't know why I didn't do it, but I didn't do it. Uh, but now I'm like so meticulous when it comes to like everything about my recipes. All right. So now bottling. So what you'll need for a bottling. Uh, we are going to need 12 ounce bottles, eight to 10 of them, bottle caps with a bottle capper, your auto siphon or siphon, an eighth cup of sugar and star sand, obviously, because we're going to sanitize everything. So sanitize everything you think you may need uh, in this process, just as you would before. I recommend at this point, you get a bucket, um, just an empty bucket. So when you're filling your cider from the now cider that's fermented in the second jug into your bottles, that it just doesn't go all over the place. Another suggestion I have for you folks is have a friend, right? Bribe them. You're like, I'll give you two bottles of my cider. Just come ha hang out and help me. Because it's going to be a pain for you to, unless you have like the clamp that stops the actual filling of the bottles, it's going to be a pain to like pull the siphon out and then run to cap it. And it's just annoying. And it's easier. <laughs> it can be done, but it's easier if you have an extra set of hands. Um, so sanitize everything you're going to use. Make a priming sugar. It's an eighth cup of sugar into water. And you just like pour it evenly in each like eyeball it into each bottle. Uh, and then you fill the cider to the next because obviously once it carbonates it, if you fill it too much, it's going to pop open. If you don't, um, so it's it's best if you fill it enough with the sugar, obviously, because you want to carbonate it the way you want to carbonate it. And then I would just fill it to the neck of the bottles um, and then cap them real quick, right? And then you leave them in a cool environment for two weeks. Crack open the bottle, enjoy. Uh, and if you're storing them, store them in the fridge. Now, why are we storing them in a nice, cool fridge? Um, we didn't use any sulfites in this, and we didn't use any potassium sorbate in this. So I totally skipped over that step on purpose. This is our first batch, right? Intro of Cider 101. Um, to just go ahead and assume that we're going to drink this for the next you know, couple of weeks or so. One way you can use uh, as a new home cider maker, uh, potassium sorbate. But keep in mind, potassium sorbate does not kill off the yeast. It just slows down re-fermentation. Um, and so, you know, you just want to follow the instructions uh, on the bottle to, you know, if you're going to keep it for longer and also if you're going to add fruits or anything else to it. So when would you put the potassium sorbate? Well, right before bottling, when you're done with fermentation, you throw in the potassium sorbate and you let it for a couple of days, leave for a couple of days. And then you'll add, if you want to add your tincture, you want to add some fruits, whatever you want, you want to add, you know, in there um, for your bottle. That's what I would add, the potassium sorbate. Flavor wheel. All right. So I was going to go into all off flavors because you're going to get some nasty stuff uh, with these off flavors. Um, but this is a flavor wheel that you can actually like take a look. And, and gives you uh, a lot of judges will use this for the competitions. Sometimes you'll get like a cider, it's done. And I'm like, well, what's wrong? Why, why does it smell like, you know, cardboard? Or like, why does it smell like nail polish? Or, like, what is it, you know, what happened? Like, why does it smell like, I don't know, vinegar or eggs or burnt rubber? Like that sort of thing. And you start to panic, right? And so first off, this helps you identify. But a couple of things really it comes down to like cleanliness. Uh, one thing, you know, oxidation. Too much headspace, not enough headspace in these, you know, when you're in these jugs or buckets that you're going to use. Um, you know, good sanitation, balanced yeast. I mean, there's a number of reasons why your cider can have off flavors. And, you know, luckily there are some ways you can prevent them next time. Um, cleaning the fruit, uh, that's another one. Maintaining, you know, free SO2, which I didn't get into like, you know, adding the sulfites here, but, uh, you know, stuff like that. Um, you know, hygiene, again, sanitizing, cleaning things. That's usually like the number one like issue at oxidation. I've noticed at least like making cider at home. Um, but don't fret, obviously, uh, you know, if we're going to use this recipe as a starting base, assuming the sanitation is well, temperature is, you know, healthy enough for the yeast. Hopefully your cider, your first batch should go pretty well. 
Um, but obviously you can, you know, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions with this. Um, I also wanted to include some uh, cider making resources um, just because they've been helpful to me. Um, we have Cider Institute of North America, which I mentioned like two or three times. I'm not like their brand ambassador or anything. I just really believe in their program. Uh, and then we have the, uh, they have a suggested reading list for people that are first starting off in uh, Cider. Uh, American Cider Association also has like a reference book, uh, like a whole list of reference books, not just for like, they do like certification programs uh, for Cider, certified Cider professional and public year but also like as a cider enthusiast and cider maker and educator. Um, and then there are a couple of books I want to throw out there. Uh, we have Cider Hard and Sweet History, Traditions and Making Your Cider by Ben Watson. I met him like, I guess a year and a half ago um, at, a, uh, I think it was the Big E Cider competition in like Massachusetts or Connecticut, somewhere up there. And I bugged out, I'm like, oh my God. And I left the book at home, like a nerd. I was like, oh, could have had him sign it. Anyway, great book. Uh, the Big Book of Cider Making, Expert Techniques for Fermenting and Flavoring Your Favorite Hard Cider. And we have the New Cider Maker's Handbook, a comprehensive guide for uh, craft producers. And that's a hardcover one. Uh, and then we have, uh, I just threw up my blog up there. I've got some recipes, not just for cider, but gluten-free brewing and um, hard lemonade called Scooter Pea, uh, along with other like uh, interviews that I've done with other cider makers and other, you know, homebrew clubs and whatnot. Um, I see we have a bunch of questions. Um, what would be your perfect apple hot combination? Oh, oh geez, what did I just do? Let's see. My favorite, what well, perfect hot apple hot combination would be, well, I guess, I guess this one right here. I, I mean, I love, I love the, Minerian Bavaria hops. And I think I use like, I think I use a quarter pa a quarter ounce in the one gallon, I believe. That sounds about right. <laughs> so that would be my uh, perfect hop combination. All right, let's see. Can you suggest something I can add secondary uh, to an apple, cherry, cran I have fermenting right now and round out the flavor? Well, let's see. What are you looking for? I have a question, uh, Gina. Let's see. Michelle, if you scroll through the question list, there's a second question about rounding out flavor. Maybe you can talk about body and mouthfeel and- That's yeah, sure, let's see. Great, go through all this one. Well, one thing you can add is malic acid. I mean, that's what I, I usually add to. I didn't, I don't think I added that in my recipe. Um, but they sell malic acid. So sometimes when you make these like ciders from the store, you don't get that oomph that you want. It kind of comes like thin and flat and you don't get that, the, the complexity of like the apple you're looking for. And if you add a little malic acid, that can go a long way. I actually, I used it on this one. I didn't add that on my recipe. Um, but um, I know that from just experience that if you add it in primary uh, as opposed to secondary, you won't taste it as much. Like you can sometimes taste, I guess, I don't know, maybe it's because I've been doing it for a while. I can taste potassium sorbate and malic acid like all the time. Like if, if like a cider uses it, I could like taste it. Um, same thing with like malic acid. If they like put it later on when it's like done, like in like, secondary, like in the bottles or kegs, I can taste it. Um, so I would use malic acid just to kind of give you more of that bold flavor. Um, let's see. Kavikis. Have I ever used Kavikis? Jamie, we were just talking about this, remember? <laughs> we were just talking about this. So I've only had gluten-free Kavikis one time, and I'm waiting on Omega, I believe it's called. They're actually, we've been in touch of using that yeast strain. So no, I've not used it. I would be excited to use it. I think you should absolutely use it. Don't have any recommendations for using for cider. I haven't used it yet. Um, but no, I've not used it, but I definitely, uh, should try. Uh, another question we have, do you find that commercial ciders are targeted to be specific, uh, demographic? Uh, for that, they do have a breakdown for like a specific demographic, but I believe, I believe I have to check because the Nielsen report for CiderCon, which was this past January, February, I think it was February. 
I believe it's like neck and neck for uh, females and males. And then age group, it's actually millennials and not like generation like Z's. Like they're gravitating towards like hard seltzers and that kind of thing. And they're like more into like cannabis stuff. But um, for commercial ciders, they're targeted. I think it's like neck and neck for like, you know, people who identify as you know, men, women, like neck and neck um, for that. Let's see. Do you have advice for a uh, procedure for sanitizing, cleaning, fresh fruit, either primary base or secondary flavor additive? Fresh fruit. Um, for me, again, this is what I do at home, right? So I don't I haven't had the experience to do it from an orchard for the fresh picked apples. Uh, but at home, I literally just like wash my apples really well and just peel them. And that's what I use. Back on wood, haven't had an issue uh, as far as. Uh, cleaning the actual fresh fruit um that has been you know what i that's what i've been doing um but obviously you want to um make sure like every i think you use any tool even the scissor you use to like cut your yeast like make sure like that's clean uh let's see what else have i used other sugars like coconut sugar no i have not uh i've not used coconut sugar before i think that you should definitely try that one i know people that have used like stevia i think before or like one of those those sweeteners and i gotta say um even if they use it in primary it definitely is like so like pungent that you could like taste it like they've used i've had friends use it for for cider and you could totally taste it um so i'm assuming this is assumption not based on experience but i'm assuming that somewhat just like brown sugar somewhat you might get the coconut to come out or maybe not sometimes coconut's hard to get i've made ciders pineapple coconut ciders where like I don't even put I don't even put like 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 addition additional fruits or anything in primary. Like I totally just ferment everything, just the juice, and then I play around with my tinctures. Like for that coconut, like I would just take coconut shredded, unsweetened coconut in vodka, and like I would I would measure different sizes of the cider with like a dropper of the actual tincture to see like what balance I want. Um, and then keep in mind, obviously, like room temperature versus cold, carbonated, whatever, that changes the whole mouthfeel of things. There are times where I've put too much of something, like uh, I made a beer one time, and it was like, you know, coconut, it was like coconut chocolate coffee. I don't even know why I did this. Coconut chocolate coffee, brown nail. And I was like, oh, it's not coming the way I want it. And like I carbonated, this was like a long time ago, I carbonated through it in like McKeezer, and I pumped it out. I was like, whoa, this is really sweet. Like, or like, oh my God, that coffee was like too much. Like I don't even get the coconut. And so it's like really important for you guys, for everyone to take samples and try it out and measure things out. Uh, but keep in mind as a home brewer, you know, an amateur cider maker at home, that things will change. So awesome. So let's see, vanilla and oak. Yes, I've done things with vanilla and oak. You can use uh, Madagascar. Vanilla is very difficult. Uh, one suggestion I do have for everyone is, um, Amoretti makes awesome products. Uh, that has been super, super helpful for me making cider as well as uh, using in my beer, especially gluten-free beer. Gluten-free beer, um, you know, quite difficult to do at home. Not impossible, obviously. Um, people have done it. You know, there's a whole bunch of, you know, little homebrew clubs and national one that like uh, Zero Gravity, I think it's called, that makes gluten-free beer. Uh, but Amoretti has been so helpful with me, uh, just kind of adding to the gluten-free beer that I want to make. Um, and I've used insider too. You can use, they have like the purees, they have like the syrups, um, they have, you know, so many different types of, uh, I think they have like puree syrups, pastes, I believe. So I would suggest, um, using Amoretti. So do we have any more questions for anyone? Anyone else? Let's see. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for hopping on. Hope you uh, learned a little bit about cider making. If you have any questions, uh, all my information is in the chat. Again, my name is Michelle Pagano. You can follow me on Instagram or Facebook. Uh, my handle is the Brew Babe. Uh, although I'm excited now as well. Uh, and my email is up there. Uh, you can check out theoutcast.com. I have some helpful information on there. Uh, and yeah, if you have any questions at all, feel free to reach out. Tomorrow, real quick, um, I will be speaking with Susanna Forbes. She's the, uh, I think, co-owner. 
of Little Pomona. Uh, it's in England, it's a cidery, it's an orchard. Uh, she's phenomenal. She's one of the women I actually, that, that inspires me. Um, she's got a ton of knowledge in cider, but also like a ton of experience. And we're actually gonna talk about uh, our journey in cider and where we've come from two different backgrounds. So coming from two different backgrounds and where we came from and what we've learned and you know what we hope to find. Um, you know, and she's across the sea, she's across the ocean, she's in the UK. So be uh, an interesting conversation. I hope you all can join. That's tomorrow morning. I believe it's 9, 9 or 9.15 uh, Pacific time, but you could see it on the schedule. But anyway, thanks so much for uh, joining in and um, enjoy the rest of your conference. Huge thank you to Michelle Pagano. That was an amazing talk. Um, before I let everyone go, uh, I want to remind you that this session was recorded and you will be able to go back and listen to it if you want to. Um, if you thought this conversation was amazing, uh, please head over to the exhibit hall and keep the conversation going. And thank you for you guys for attending. I hope you, this was enjoyable and valuable.